Okay, welcome. This is Kathy Sipple, and you are here for Day 5 of Explorations and Website Building. This is Part 2 of building a WordPress site that we started yesterday, Thursday, and we'll be continuing on. Um, we are using as kind of a, a guide an ebook that I created that is hosted on Pinterest. So if you'd like to download this or follow along, you can go to pinterest.com forward slash Kathy Sipple and it's in the it's on the board called marketing toolbox so that's pinterest.com forward slash Kathy Sipple you go to marketing toolbox and it's the one that kind of has a little sales funnel on it and um, I you know have forewarned that I may go a little bit over an hour because um, I'm kinda of talking through a lot of options that you may or may not want or need um, so, any case, we yesterday got through quite a bit. We installed WordPress. We set it up on the host. Let me get back to that. Um, this thing does have links in it and all, so you can you can go through and follow along if this is something that you choose to do. We got pretty much through different types of websites, a home for your website, talking about the importance of a good host and uh, naming your website, assigning the domain. Uh, installing WordPress, installing the uh, the theme, which we chose the Divi theme from Elegant Themes, and logging onto the site and getting started. Let's see. Okay, I think we're pretty much about there. And then I made this little punch list. Um, these are kind of a checklist of things that I end up doing almost every single time that I, I do a website, so I thought I might as well put them on a list and just uh, share them with you. So let's go ahead and get into the website that I built yesterday. This is um, doomandliving.com. It's currently, um, we're looking at the, the WordPress dashboard. It's, it's not all that um, intuitive, I think, when you're used to looking at Weebly or Wix or something more like that where what's going on on screen seems to always be front and center. With WordPress, you've got to toggle between, um, you know, the dashboard, which is the view that we've got now, and visit site. And frankly, if you visit the site right now, it's it's not all that exciting. It's it doesn't look all that pretty. And you know that is maybe a little harder for people that are visually oriented to to work with. Um, but I think that there are some advantages. Again, we covered a lot of them yesterday, so I won't completely review. But many of them have to do with optimizing your content, especially if you're somebody that is going to be writing quite a bit. Okay, so um, again, let me just kind of go to my checklist. Changing the password, number one, the password that WordPress randomly assigns is, you know, pretty hard to remember. So you can change your um, password pretty easily just going into settings. And uh, let me think about that. Is that where it is? No. You know what? It's under users. So users is where you go. Okay, so you can edit um, pretty much anything about yourself. One cool thing too is that you can, um, you know, add a little bio that becomes attached to, you know, whenever somebody clicks on you as an author to find out a little bit more about you. You can also have other users, which is kind of nice. So if you have a tech support person, they can be a separate user. You don't have to give them your logon info. Um, if you have contributing bloggers, let's say, you know, if you're going to kind of be doing something, um, you know, beyond just you, that's that's a neat thing that gives people multiple ways to be involved. So you can decide. I'm not going to go through every single different role here because I'm not sure that's going to apply for everybody. Administrator is the highest. You know, that gives you the ability to do pretty much everything that I'm doing here today. <clears throat> Editor you know, has few, fewer rights. You can make some changes, but not completely, um, you know, themes and stuff like that. Author, contributor, subscriber. Subscriber is the kind of lowest level, and basically that's a way that somebody can say, hey, I want to, um, you know, be notified whenever there's a new post. Um, I want to be able to comment on your blog. So subscriber is kind of a nice way to do that. Um, okay, so Lisa's asking, is there a good way to show a bio without taking a page to do it? Yeah, actually this that I'm doing right now is exactly where you would do it. 
this doesn't exactly take a page, but it, um, let me just finish up with password real quick and then I'll, I'll show you. So you can change your password right here. And um, if you create a new user, you can even just send, you know, that person a password by email. Okay. Um, so let's see, let me go back here. All users. Okay. Um, yeah, so where, where this would show up is basically, you know, if you put in a little bio info about, about you, I would put in my website. Let's say I didn't own this website, but this would be especially important if you've got contributing authors and they want to, um, you know, get acknowledgement for their own stuff. What happens is when you create a, a, excuse me, a post, different authors can, um, basically be the contributors or the editors, you know. So when that shows up, you've got the ability to show who authored it, okay. Everything is pretty customizable. You don't have to make that option available, but when you show the authors, that's a good way to let people know, number one, you know, who contributed it so the voice is clear. And then when you click on that author link, that's the only time that it will actually show up that bio info. So I hope that answers your question. I don't have it uh, live yet, so it's a little hard to, to demo that at this point. Okay, so as long as I'm here, um, let me go ahead and do this. Hello World is just a standard post that, um, you know, WordPress always puts in there. So you don't, you don't want to have that. Obviously, you want to get rid of that. It's kind of a rookie move to launch your site and still have this thing going. So you can either just delete this thing or you can, um, you know, type over it. Let me go ahead and show you where posts show up. Okay, so posts show up here. You just click on post over here on the dashboard left-hand column, all posts. And again, you can just um, simply trash this particular one, which I'm going to go ahead and do for now. Or you know what? No, before I do that, I'll demonstrate a few other concepts. Um, the author, okay, there is no author assigned right now. If there was, um, I'm the only one right now, but it would say Kathy Sipple. When this post was published, I could just click on the author attribute, and that's when it would go to the bio. So, um, yeah, Lisa, I can't really demo it. She's asking where do you click on it. It would have to be published first, and I don't have anything published yet. So. We'll, we'll get there hopefully. And then Christine is asking, is there a way to edit or check the post before it goes live? Absolutely. Um, let's go ahead and I'll just kind of address these questions as we go. Christine is also asking for the main admin to check or edit before going live. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Um, I think that would be more of an internal system that you'd have to um, you'd have to set up. I haven't personally had a lot of contributors. So that hasn't been an issue for me. Um, I think if you give somebody editing rights, basically, you know, they've got the ability to post. But I think you just have to kind of make an editorial, you know, schedule or, um, you know, make a policy that basically they schedule their posts for ahead of time. So let's go ahead and demo a few of those things since, you know, you're asking me good questions. Um, I think I can kind of roll with, with those and we can can get it all addressed. Okay, so I'm going to go into edit instead of just deleting this right now. Um, you know, what you, you might see, number one, is something below the title. Well, okay, this, this is the title. So um, let me go ahead, Doonlin Living Launches. This is not going to be a real site, by the way. I've already got plenty of sites, so I don't need to um, I don't need to have another one. This is for demo purposes only. It will be blown up after this. Okay, so every time you type something, um, WordPress is going to do some auto updates, but whenever you want to save, you can just go ahead and click update, and that's the same as save. Um, it's just saving it as a draft right now. It's not going anywhere because I'm still under construction. It, it would be a live post. I can go ahead and do view post, but it's, it's not actually viewable for the public right now. All right, um, so let's see. Let me go back. What I want to demo here is this thing called permalink. This is kind of an important concept that 
you know, WordPress really helps you on to optimize your search engine, you know, presence to be findable. Um, basically right now, the default permalink structure, which just means what's the thing that comes after the .com? You know, what is, what is the naming convention that WordPress is going to give to new posts and new pages that you create? Right now, it's just doing P equals one, like page equals one. It's the first page that I've created. Well, that is not very search engine friendly at all. And um, so there's a way to change the permalink structure that, that basically helps um, it to be a little bit more intuitive when a user views it. And pretty much anything that helps a user view it more intuitively is generally going to help Google find catalog and index you know, your site more intuitively as well. So um, you can change the permalink options by clicking you know, right there within the page, or you can get there also just by going to settings. So because I kind of not a coder, I forget what the little structure is that's preferred. I, I'm just going to go ahead and put that in my notes. Um, I couldn't even begin to tell you why exactly you type it this way. It's just, you know, what's required. Um, so I am going to go ahead and put in a custom permalink structure. I go ahead and post this. So what this is going to do is every time I create a new post or page, um, or excuse me, a post, WordPress is going to assign a category to it and the post name. So rather than being P equals 1, my post would now be, be called, you know, Duneland Living Launches, as well as whatever category I name it. This is going to become a little bit more obvious when I, when I show it to you live, but for now I'm going to do Save Changes, and um, I am updating my ebook to include these little tips. There's also an article here that kind of explains why on earth you do this. It's going to be a little deep to get into for today's purposes. But, you know, SEO is, I think, one of the main reasons that a lot of bloggers really like, you know, WordPress and feel like it's worth doing is when you're, you know, you're writing, you obviously want things to be found. So this is just, um, again, echoing what I just did, clicking custom structure and then putting, putting that in. All right, um, so let's go back. We did save change. And then I'll go back to post. And let's go back to edit. All right, and so um, because it was named Hello World originally, it looks like it's, it's still picking up that original name. Uh, so that might be one good reason to delete it rather than to rename it. Uh, there probably is a way to manually go change it, but I'm just going to go into All Posts, get rid of it, and we'll start a new one. Okay, so let's just do Add New Post. I did cover quickly yesterday the difference between posts and pages. Pages are the static content within your website, you know, the about us, the um, programs and services, that kind of thing, whereas posts are little news articles that you're, you know, going to write much more frequently. You know, I'm just going to not really put anything in here. This is a sample post. Um, we'll be doing lots more great work here soon. Okay. Um, obviously, this is not a very compelling post. A real post would have, number one, like 200 to 500 words. That's kind of the optimal length for, for Google to, to find you to figure out what your point is and for you to have, you know, just a couple of categories. If you get beyond 500 words, what tends to happen is, um, you know, you're, you're talking about everything but the kitchen sink, and it's really hard for Google and probably a reader to figure out what is this post about. A blog is really optimized best when you add categories, and you know this one, you know, just as a welcome, it's it's not really all that compelling. But let's just say for Duneland Living that we imagine um, we're going to have some things that we'll talk about on a regular basis, like restaurant reviews. Okay. Um, I kind of think of a category as something that, uh, this is an analogy I've used before, like a manila folder, okay? You wouldn't create a category for something that you're only ever going to talk about once. So you probably wouldn't set up a manila folder in your file cabinet 
if anybody still uses paper, you know, to put in like one tiny little piece of paper. This is something that you're going to house multiple pieces of information in. All right, whereas um, there's something below category called tag. Tag is more like a post-it note, you know. You want to just kind of draw attention to why did I put in this particular piece of paper into my manila folder. You know, it helps you retrieve it more easily again. So let's just say, um, you know, I did a restaurant review on a place called Third Coast Spice Cafe, one of my favorite restaurants in the Dunland area. So I could absolutely use that as a tag. That's like a post-it note. I'll use those freely, okay? But so let's just say, um, let's, let's make this a little easier. Dunlin Living uh, visits, you know, Third Coast Spice. This will make it a little bit more relevant for this example, okay? Um, we recommend the omelets. Not sure if that's the right way to spell omelets. Um, anyway, let's let's just say this was a full out you know restaurant review. I would put you know the category is restaurant review. I would put um, you know tag as the specific. I might even put something like omelet if I really wanted to get crazy. You know I'm probably not going to be writing about omelets over and over again. Uh, Third Coast Spice happens to be in Chesterton. So I, if I'm going to be writing about Chesterton a lot, I could either make that a category or a tag. That one could probably almost go either way. The nice thing is these are kind of malleable. You know, you don't have to have the set in stone. You can kind of change up your categories and tags as you create content and figure out what you're going to be doing. But um, it really helps your user. If you're going to be a, you know, an author or a blogger that creates a lot of content, it might not seem like it's that difficult to find stuff at the beginning, but you know I've told people think about it like you're creating a mall and you go into the biggest mall that you've ever been in. I don't know if you've ever been to Mall of America up in Minneapolis, but it's you know a huge mall. If you just knew that you wanted to buy a pair of women's gloves, um, and there's this huge mall, you know it's out there. So let's pretend like the mall is the internet, or maybe the mall is. Um, you know, it's even your blog if you've got just a ton of content. So you know that you can buy things there, but there was no directory. You know, there was no directory that says you are here, you know, here's how to find clothing stores. You know, you'd have to kind of look through every single type of store. You'd have to look through every type of, you know, thing. It would just, it would be crazy. So the categories are almost like um, in a mall, the thing that would tell you women's apparel and the tag would be the thing that says gloves, okay? So it's like the a little bit more general to the more specific. I hope that kind of helps. So as you're creating content, you know, just think about what is your user experiencing when they come to your, your site? Are they going to be able to kind of find this more easily? The cool thing is once you post um, <clears throat> content, then you, you've also got the ability to show categories and tags right below it and that becomes um, kind of like wayfinding help for your reader or for your viewer where they can say, you know, show me more like this category or show me more like this tag. You know, so if they're really interested in omelets or they're really interested in Chesterton or whatever the case might be, your content, you know, serves not just the, the function of providing, you know, serving up that one piece of content that becomes an entree into other areas of similar, you know, similar subjects. So Georgia is asking, if you were doing more of an online magazine and some of the pieces were going to be more than 500 words and have artwork and pictures, would you still put this in post? Yes, I would. Um, I would, I mean, if it's not substantially over 500, I'd say that's okay, but if you're getting upwards of, you know, 800 or 1,000 words, one one way that you can handle that is to serialize the content. So what you do is kind of break it up into more, you know, manageable bite-sized pieces, and it could be part one of a five-part series, you know, part two, and so that each, each part would have, um, you know, maybe a more defined category within the whole. Those are just guidelines to be optimized on Google. It's not like, you know, the blogging police are going to come and slap your hands or anything. It's just it's kind of like walking into Marshall Fields, you know, and just not having, or whatever Marshall Fields is these days, I can't even remember, um, and not having, you know, 
signage, basically. So if you're going to do huge posts, then you know you've got to just think through your category strategy, perhaps a little bit, a little bit differently. So again, no real rules, but you know, and I know we started out the week with it being all about the flash and the look, and you know that stuff is really, really cool and great. Um, if if you are more of an artist, if you're not going to be, um, you know, maybe putting in a lot of text, then I don't, <clears throat> I don't know that you need to optimize, you know, with this level. But if you're going to be, you know, a writer, and you're you're putting out a lot of written content, then I think this this really can be worthwhile. Okay, so anyway, um, we haven't talked too much about adding images. We uploaded a logo yesterday, but you can also add images um, to the post itself. I probably should have, uh, let me just see here, Third Coast Spice. I'm going to just get their logo real quick and, and put it in. Um, I would say, you know, for a restaurant review, probably nobody would be too disappointed if you wanted to, uh, you know, download their their logo and use it, especially if you're going to say great things. Um, Third Coast Spice. Okay, but you do kind of have to download an image somewhere in order to upload it. Uh, let's see, here we go. I'm going to do Add Media. I need to Upload Files. Select. I just saved that to Desktop. Third Coast Spice. Okay, and put it in. Uh, and then I can say um, I am going to, I've got some alignment and some placement options over here to the right, attachment display settings. Usually I just find it a little bit easier to align right for whatever reason. Um, link to, your default option is link to a media file. So that means if somebody clicks on that, they're just going to kind of go to this place where this media file is stored. That's typically not going to be a real helpful, you know, um, thing because they're just going to see a static page. What I would do to be more helpful to the people that I'm, you know, referring would be a custom URL and I would link that logo right to Third Coast Spices um, page, okay? So, where did that go? Here we go. So I would paste in that um, Third Coast, you know, Spice actual logo. Uh, you can choose what size you want it to be, medium, full size. I'm just going to go with medium, see how that looks, and we'll go with that. Okay, so that's kind of showing up over here to the right. You know, this is obviously the world's uh, probably shortest blog post, uh, but the, the point is to show you functionality at this, at this point in time, not to, you know, be typing in front of you, and I didn't go ahead and write a review. Um, but anyway, let's go ahead and let's just say publish. Okay, so now what you can see, if we go to um, visit site, all right, if you just click visit site, you're going to be dumped off at the home page, doolittleliving.com. What happened here is when I created a post, that generated its own URL, you know, Universal Resource Locator or Uniform Resource Locator, depending on who you talk to. So what you can see now is up in the address bar, instead of, you know, P equals 1, which was that default um, permalinks, you can see doomlandliving.com, restaurant-reviews, Doomland Living visits Third Coast Spice Cafe. So the reason that that's pulling in that way or that it's creating that very long name is that we had set up the permalinks to be categories first and then the name of the post. So if I had named it differently, named this post differently, you know, it would look different. If I had categorized it differently, if I had categorized it in two or three different categories, it would be a super, super long name, but it would be really kind of easy for Google to figure out what the heck I'm talking about. It's, you know, evidently I'm in an area called Duneland, I'm reviewing restaurants, and specifically I'm reviewing Third Coast Spice Cafe. So let's just think about if you are somebody who has no idea that Duneland Living exists, and you, you know, you type in visiting Doonlin, where should I eat? Well, guess what? You know, when you've taken the time to set up your site this way, you're kind of a lot more likely to draw in eyeballs than somebody that did DoonlinLiving.com P equals one, because Google is going to have no idea, you know, what you're about as a blogger. Okay. So that's where it gets kind of interesting. You know, there are a lot of different tools that you can use.
All right. Uh, so let me go back to my checklist here. Change the password. Um, we already added the contact info and customized theme options yesterday. We made made and added the favicon. I did put in a little link to just you know favicon generator. There are many out there. Okay, this is an important one. Changing the settings, reading, writing, tagline, and all that jazz. What you're going to do there is go into settings on the dashboard area. And um, the site title, this is the default, which obviously is really no good. It SS site title. So you want to type over that. You don't have to put it the same as your um, domain, but you know generally that's probably going to be a good idea. Let's just call it, you know, Doomland Living for now, and tagline will be, um, you know, um, what's the, I know the Tourism Bureau has something that they call Beyond, Beyond the Beach. So we'll just do a riff on that. I don't know that I would do that in real life, but, um, you know, restaurants, um, favorite, favorite places. Uh, favorite sites, I don't know, and experiences, we'll just go with that. You want to, you know, again, just kind of tell what the site is about, think SEO, think, you know, with integrity, what is your site really about, but, you know, the reason that it kind of makes sense to do that, again, is partly for Google, partly for, you know, your your readers. So membership, you can let anybody register. Um, if you want to make it be really engaging, you know, it's probably a good idea. I would say making the default role be the subscriber rather than something stronger is probably a good idea. You want to know if somebody's contributing to your site, you know, who they are, I would think, um, unless it's a real crowdsourced kind of thing and that's intentional to make it very open. You want to change the, the time zone format. Uh, you can either do it by, if you happen to know that you're six hours ahead of Greenwich Mean Time and you want to do it that way, great. Or you can just pick a city that's nearby in the same time zone as you. Um, I don't much care, you know, what day my week starts on, but if you want to change those up, you can. If you have a different language, you can. All of these tend to stay the same for me, and then I'll just do Save Changes. The next thing under Settings is Writing and Reading. Okay. Um, WordPress actually gives you some options where, you know, you can say if you're going to be writing about restaurant reviews every single time or let's say, you know, half of the time, you could make that the default category so that you don't have to constantly be unchecking uncategorized or deleting uncategorized. I, th I think it's really a best practice not to have any blog posts that are uncategorized because that's, again, making your user just kind of jump into the melee and try to retrieve what the heck did they have in mind when they wrote this post. You know, uncategorized just feels a little lazy to me. But if it, you're going to be writing about a wide variety of things, um, you know, you, you'll just have to remember to every time check the right, check the right thing. For now, I'm going to say just make it a restaurant review unless I change it. Um, you've got the ability to have different types of post formats. You know, usually they're going to be just a story. But if you want to make it a status update, if you're going to be doing mostly video, if you want to call in your blog post, you can actually make an audio post. Um, there are a number of different things that you can do. If you are going to do mostly a, um, you know, image-based kind of thing, you can make your default post type an image. I'm going to just leave it where it is right now. Um, okay, so you can change your, your mail categories. I'm not going to really get way into that. When you publish a new post, WordPress automatically notifies site update services. Pingomatic is one. You can change that up and put in, you know, additional update services if you'd like. So that just kind of helps, you know, once you've done a post, letting people know that, that you've done something. Okay, and that's automated when you, you put in some choices here. Okay, so that's a little bit about writing. That's content that you're creating. And then the next choice is how are readers going to consume your information? Do you want your front page to show a static page? So a static page, again, is one like About Us or, you know, hey, this is what CoThrive is about uh, or this is what Doonland Living is about. And you kind of set it up to, to show, you know, what that looks like. 
or is your content pretty much the first thing that you want people to see? If you're going to be kind of a news, uh, you know, magazine, then really the news is the main reason that people are coming. If you're changing up your content all the time, then probably making your front page display your latest post makes sense. But if, you know, your blog is kind of secondary, it's not something you're updating frequently, or it's just, you know, it's mainly a corporate site, the blog is a, just a function, then it might be, it might make more sense to make one of your static pages the front page. We don't have one yet, but I'll just call it sample. And then posts, you would direct to where, wherever it is that you're going to set up your post. You don't have to call blog a blog, by the way. I mean, you could call it news, you could call it updates, you could call it, you know, really whatever, whatever you want. And then you have the choice to say, how many um, posts do I want to show on my blog blog page? Um, you know, they've got it defaulting at 10, but you can do whatever you want. Um, do you want to show your full text in a feed? Like, so we talked about RSS a few weeks ago. Um, Pingomatic is, is kind of like a feed service. You can just show the summary or you can show um, full text. Search engine visibility, that's typically the reason that bloggers are doing what they're doing to begin with, is to be found by search engines. But if you're not quite ready yet, you know, you, you want to make it public but not, um, not yet indexing, you do have that choice. It's usually not a great choice for marketing, but um, if you did want to do that for some reason, you could make it, it won't be exactly hidden, but, you know, you, you can do that, okay? So... What else? Um, discussion. This is a choice that you'll need to kind of think about. Um, you can actually let, you can attempt to let blogs linked to from the article know that you've been linked to. So that's, you know, usually a pretty um, nice feature. People like to know that their stuff is being read and referenced. The one thing you don't want to do is just copy somebody else's whole blog post in its entirety because that's that's their content. I mean, number one, you know, it's just it's not it's not nice, it's not good form to just take somebody's content. And number two, you've given the reader really no reason to go and, and check out that other author's blog. But to link to something, you know, even if it's just a picture like I did with the Third Coast um, Spice. You know, if I'm showing, hey, this this logo came from them, and here's you know here's their menu, um, they might they might be kind of favorable to me, uh, knowing that I gave them a good good review, and they might kind of help me by giving me a shout out. You know, if if they're a blogger, they're a restaurant, so they're probably not really blogging. Um, anyway, uh, you can ask that comment commenters, you know, fill out their name and email, probably a good practice just so you can try to avoid spam. It depends where you want to go with this. Um, some people get a little irritated by comments. They're like, what are all these people doing on my site? You know, they're messing up my site. You can actually hide con comments completely if you wish, but usually, you know, the point of blogging is to kind of be read, um, have, have an interactive experience, and so you have some decisions to make about how much commenting you want to enable, how deep the threads can go, you know. I mean, i got to say it's not a problem I've really had. <laughs> I don't tend to attract that much uh, engagement. But if you're going to do kind of a news type thing and that's your thing, then you're going to have to get into those kind of choices. All right, you can choose to either manually approve every single comment or if you've already approved an author, you can go ahead and approve them again. So that, that kind of is a nice compromise so that um, hopefully if you've approved somebody once and they weren't spammy, then they're not going to all of a sudden turn into a spammer. It's probably a good time to go to uh, another thing that has to do with spam. A Kismet is a plugin. So again, here on the dashboard, we've got a few different things. We've talked about you know users so far. We talked about settings so far. Uh, plugins is another really important part. You come into Elegant Themes, when you choose Elegant Themes, they give you some installed uh, plugins by default, and you can always deactivate or remove any that you don't wish to have. Hello Dolly, I have, for the life of me, I do not understand why they made this a um, default plugin. It's, it's like 
kind of ridiculous. It's um, this is not just a plug-in. It symbolizes the hope and enthusiasm of an entire generation. Anyway, it's it's just bizarre. I don't know of anybody that ever leaves this. But the first thing you need to do before you can remove a plugin is just to hit deactivate. And once it's deactivated, then you can delete it. Okay, you can't delete something if it's active. I always, always, always delete that and say yes, delete these files. Um, plugins again are little pieces of code that third-party programmers do that give your blog different functionality. Okay, this kind of allows a non-coder to be able to instantly, you know, give your your blog all kinds of various capabilities. Um, we're going to talk about just a few of them right now, and then I'll show you where you can find out more. Akismet is um, a way that you can protect your blog from, you know, comment spam, and it's it's my favorite way to do it. You can get a free account if it's for your personal blog. The way that you activate a Kismet is you have to get something called an API. So it's a key that uh, allows you to kind of create a handshake between your blog and this this plugin. So you can go here, get an API key, and you know because it's exciting to get comments, but it's only exciting when they're real people. We don't want people trying to sell you know, Viagra or whatever, you know, people just kind of do their, their thing. Um, so I already do have a corporate key. I'm not going to purchase one again. But, you know, you can make a donation or you can use it for free. Um, use a Kismet for a personal site. Uh, I would have to sign up. I'm not going to go through that to do it. But what you would do is, you know, go through this process. You would get a relatively long key that's generated for you. You would just simply paste that key in here and then say use this key. And what that does is it sets up kind of a spam management uh, program for you within WordPress. So every time you come on it will say, hey these um, 20 comments are waiting moderation. You know, you can say that's spam, delete that, block this user, approve this comment, whatever you want to do according to your own uh, preferences. Okay. So let's go back to plugins, but I, I heartily recommend Akismet. There might be something else, but I, I really feel like that's probably the best one. Um, Jetpack, this is another great one that um, Elegant Themes makes a standard. So to activate it, what you need to do is just connect it to your WordPress account. Um, I already have my WordPress account set up, so I'm going to say, OK, go ahead, authorize that connection. And what that allows you to do is it kind of gives you access to a whole family of plugins that otherwise you'd probably go through and um, be wanting to, you know, to install one at a time. So let's just go to the settings page and you can kind of see what Jetpack gives you. And again, this is all free. It's, you know, totally, totally free. Um, a lot of different things really too many to go into in just you know one one talk um, but let's think about some of the most important publicize you know being in the business that I'm in social media publicize is kind of you know big so once you have this in it just makes your users very um, it makes it a lot easier for them to publicize your posts so if somebody likes what you've done um, online, then they can automatically, you know, kind of share it by email. They can print it out if they like it. They can share it on LinkedIn, stumble upon, you know, things that you may not be on. But if your users are and they feel compelled to share it there, it, it just makes it very easy for them to do. So that's certainly a good thing too. So I love WordPress for these reasons that you can install so many different plugins that you can almost do you know, virtually anything. You can go up into add new plugins and there's a whole plugin market marketplace. Um, just a few things that I'm seeing here, BuddyPress. BuddyPress is something you can layer on that kind of almost transforms your website into a Facebook-like experience. People can become friends with one another. They can, um, you know, there's just all kinds of things that they can do. It's It's fairly complex, not for the faint of heart. I'm not saying saying do it just for the sake of doing it. But let's let's think of something um, that somebody might want to do. Um, I don't know. Sometimes people like these. 
if you've ever been on a, a WordPress site and um, sometimes the categories aren't just in a pull-down menu, they're in something that looks like a little cloud. So the more, the more times you blog about a certain category, the word will appear bigger within the cloud relative to others that you've perhaps not, you know, talked about as much. Okay. Again, I'm not saying this is, you know, for everybody or that everybody wants to do it, but it's, it's just, you know, one example that's coming to mind. There are virtually endless, I mean, there were 549 items that just came up with cloud. Um, let's see. I, use, I do a lot of podcasts. I haven't even looked this up recently. But if, if you do podcast, you can do a podcast plugin. Uh, seriously simple podcasting. You almost just want to think about what it is you're trying to do and then type in either the keyword or some functionality and odds are there's a plugin or multiple plugins for you. There are 82 plugins that have to do with podcasting. Now, you know, in order not to go through all of them, what I typically do to try to eliminate um, ones that might break easily is to go with um, either recommended, you know, you can go into the recommended tab and just see what other people are, you know, talking about, which, which ones they like. If they've got a lot of downloads, you know, if you're in the millions of downloads, odds are it's probably a pretty decent thing that's not going to break or people wouldn't keep using it. Um, if it's in version one, you know, and there are no stars or one star, I would probably stay away from that unless you're a real experimental bleeding edge type and, and you know what you're getting into. But um, any, any that have, you know, five stars, hundreds of thousands or millions of downloads and, you know, good reviews, I would say, you know, go for those, do yourself a favor. Okay. But it's good news, bad news, you know, that it, Everybody can contribute the stuff, and it's, for the most part, free. However, you know, what I w witnessed just a few days ago with, um, I'll just show you what it was. It was something called Slide Deck. It's a really cool thing that actually allows, um, you know, people to bring in images from a variety of um, content places, okay, including Pinterest. So I work with a couple, you know, artists that just don't really want to be bogged down with, hey, once I create the art, I just want to share it somewhere and then, um, you know, make it easy to get the image into my WordPress. I mean, after you've taken the time to maybe put it on your Etsy store, you can pin it pretty easily right from Etsy. So I had set up some sites that would just um, create a slider based on whatever was being pinned to your board would automatically be uploaded to your website. It sounded like a pretty elegant solution, but then the, the slider broke. The developer isn't, you know, looking like they're going to fix it. They only had, you know, two and a half stars, but it was the only thing that did it. The bad news is once that's broken and there's no other, you know, there's no other solution, I had to go back to my clients and say, well, that solution that you really loved, that doesn't exist anymore, you know. Um, so it, it's, it's just kind of a hard thing. It's, you know, 10 people have given it one star, so I think there's a lot of backlash right now that people are not liking it now that it's not doing what we thought it would do. Um, so, it, you know, it is good news and bad news. There are programmers that would almost let, let your site do anything, but there are, there are downsides to it. So Christine is asking, um, or Lisa is asking, so plugins are to a blog or website like apps are to smartphones. Yeah, that's a great analogy. It gives it, you know, additional functionality, and that, that's true. Christine is saying would have to watch out for copyright with that. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Was that the slide deck for Pinterest? If that's what you're referring to in this case, it was actually the artist's own images that they were uploading. So there wouldn't be any problem with copywriting it. It was um, stuff that they, they were developing. But you're right. You're right. Okay, for Pinterest in general. So that's, you know, that's plugins. And I realize we're not getting way, way deep into, you know, the theme options. But let me just hopefully say that um, theme this Divi theme is probably the closest that I've been able to find to Weebly or Wix. I, it's not quite as elegant a solution, but I feel like if you decide to go into this, 
you're going to get a relatively similar experience. It's, again, it's not exactly as easy. It's really not. But the reasons that you might decide to take this on instead of, you know, one of the earlier solutions like Wix or Weebly are for the reasons that I'm showing you. So that's why I'm kind of deciding to, um, you know, spend a little bit more time here. Now, several people have asked me, too, um, about importing and exporting content. So if, if you know, for some reason I haven't scared you away yet <laughs> and you want to, you know, import your existing blog or your site into to here and, and do it, then that all happens under tools, okay? So if you have posts or comments in another system, WordPress can import those into the site, um, you know, if you've got one of these. If you don't have one of these, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. You can search the plugin directory and see if there's something that's been developed for the specific, you know, thing that you need. But this is where you would start, you know, with the import export process. Okay. And so um, I think that hopefully will answer your question, Deb. Will the old info go into the new theme? Um, pages are a little different. You know, this is talking about um, posts and comments, not the pages per se. But um, check the plugin directory, check your hosting tech support. They can kind of step you through how to export and import things like databases. That's definitely going to be like beyond the scope of what I can cover <clears throat> in today's. But this is, you know, just a way that you can get the majority of your comments and your posts so that if you're a blogger, you don't want to, you know, that, that's something you couldn't really very easily do via other routes. Okay, and just changing the theme, no problem. That's under appearance. So appearance is here, and Divi is the theme that I'm using. This is, um, again, one of the elegant themes solutions, and it has a lot of different um, elements. Uh, they, they actually have elegant themes, uh, has their own little movie. It's not quite as elegant as the Jeff Bridges thing that we watched the other day. It's a lot of, you know, just talking heads, so I'm not going to roll the, the, um, the demo. But you can either, you know, sign up to look at a live theme demo, or you can just watch the short video and decide, you know, does this look like a, a trade-off that's good enough for me? There is, you know, some degree of drag-and-drop functionality. Um, let me see here. Maybe I can quickly, I'll quickly do that. You can very, very easily change your theme, though, okay? So in an instant, I can just activate this other theme or this one, and poof, you know, I've got a different theme. Let me just go ahead and activate that. We'll do a live preview, and, you know, with, um, oh, does it cite? Here we go. Okay, so, you know, totally different look. It's kind of, you know, changing up the wallpaper. Uh, on your house. You know, again, yesterday we kind of used that house analogy, picking out where are you going to build, you know, the location, the domain was kind of your address, and then, you know, all of these other choices are about kind of the architecture and the look and feel of the particular house, okay? So, um, you know, you can, you can search installed themes here, you can add new. If you find one on a place like Theme Forest that I mentioned to you yesterday, uh, that has over 18,000, you know, themes, so they're, they're just like endless, endless possibilities. But right now I'm going to reactivate Divi, and um, I'm going to show you a little bit of that functionality. We haven't added any pages yet, so I'm going to go ahead and add new. Okay, so Christine is saying, I can change my theme even though there are already a lot of pages on the site now. Yes, yes you can. Um, sometimes you do get a few unintended consequences, but, um, you know, you definitely can. It's usually a fairly streamlined process, um, but, you know, that's why you can preview it, and then you can always go back. Um, one thing, too, I do want to say about going back is my host backs up my site every single day, so if I've done something that I just cannot undo, I can always restore it. So that's a cPanel function. We talked about the cPanel function within the hosting yesterday. I'm not going to, you know, bring that panel back up. But don't panic. You know, if you quote unquote break your site, you can basically restore it to, you know, for me, I think it's backed up every day at about 9 p.m. So I know I can always get back to that. 
there are additional services that you can sign up for that will even give you, um, you know, more robust, uh, more robust restoration processes. And then, you know, another thing I've pointed out to people, this is kind of cool, a little, I think I'm on topic, but um, the Wayback Machine. If you have, you know, a site that you had like years ago and for some reason it's just broken or doesn't exist anymore, you can actually go to this digital archive of the internet and you can, you know, look for your site as it might have existed, you know, two years ago or whatever, and you might be able to at least copy and paste information from it or jog your memory. You know, I've had some people like, oh, I forgot to renew my domain. It's just all is lost. I have no idea what was on it. This might save your bacon. You know, it's, it's a little off topic of what we're doing, but just, you know, if I can help somebody by sharing that, great. So about us, almost everybody, um, you know, needs an about us, let's just say is, uh, she loves local food and uh, hikes at the Indiana Dunes. Okay, whatever. I um, want to point out something. As you create pages, we're not going to be creating a ton of pages here, but it's a pretty easy process to do. Um, you can basically say, does it have a parent or not? A parent means um, that it's a subpage, basically. So about us would probably be a top level, you know, navigation thing that you would want to show up in your menu. So that would probably not have a parent. If I had about us and then, you know, our team of reviewers and then everybody had their, you know, their bio there, maybe that would be a subpage under about us. In which case, when I created, you know, the team bios, that would come under the parent about us. Okay. So right now I don't have anything to assign as a parent uh, to. I can also choose from a couple different templates if I had set them up. I don't have any set up yet. But let's just go ahead and do publish for now. And this is just all pretty straightforward. It's, you know, this looks just like any, you know, blog post page or any other, you know, WordPress theme. But the part where Divi gets a little bit more like, you know, Wix or Weebly, finally, I'm getting into that part, is if you go into something called Page Builder, okay? Again, it's, it's not quite the, you know, WYSIWYG or what you see is what you get experience that you see with Weebly where it's super intuitive that, you know, I see the picture, I see my text as I'm working with it. With this, you basically have to create the little box for it, but it, you know, once you get the hang of it, it's not terribly difficult. So what I mean by that is you can add, you know, let's say add a special section. I can add a full width session, section, excuse me. I could say, um, you know, I want to add a full width slider and then I need to put in slides, okay. Um, so I can create these boxes fairly easily and I can move them around, you know, in relation to one another. I can insert modules, maybe under my slider I'd like to have, um, you know, some, let's see, specialty section. I'd like to have maybe, um, you know, let's see, a pricing table here for membership. Um, and I'd like to have perhaps, um, you know, two different stories member features that would be here. I can choose if that's going to be text and I can do that here, you know. So it's, again, once you've got all these boxes set up, then you can, you know, it's not exactly drag and drop exactly, but it's the closest that I have found that doesn't break on me. There was another one, there were another two that I used that were supposed to be drag and drop. I think I kind of mentioned them yesterday. One called page lines and one called headway themes for WordPress. They did look like a little closer to Wix or Weebly, but I had all kinds of problems and I felt like it was just harder. This I feel like once you get your, um, you know, your layout set up, it is relatively easy to then go in and, you know, edit what you've got to, to put in the pieces. Okay, and if you want the same kind of layout, you know, to use over and over again, then you can save the layout and you could call this, you know, member page or something like that. So if this is something that you're going to use, you know, one, one template that you want to apply to every single, you know, let's say member page, then this would become available to you as a layout when you go to create a new page. So you don't have to do this every single time. 
Anyway, I know we kind of covered a lot that was a little technical, opposed to, you know, what Kathy showed us earlier, but we did get through quite a bit. Um, going back to my checklist, we removed the Hello Dolly, we got rid of the Hello World comment, we connected Jetpack, we didn't get to connect social accounts and social sharing yet, but that is pretty, pretty easy um, to do, you know, through, through um, the Divi customization. So I'm, I'm not going to be terribly worried if I don't do that yet. We did the Akismet API key, or I showed you as far as I could getting there. Importing from another site, you can do that through tools, showed you how to do that. We created a page, we created a post, showed you a little bit about categories and tags. And the last thing is when you're actually ready to launch it, then you want to make sure you go back to that plugin that's the coming soon plugin, deactivate that so you actually can be found by search engines. If you did happen to choose in your setup tab, um, you know, discourage search engines from finding it and you're ready to launch, you probably want to go ahead and take that off as well. I did mention before, but um, Divi is a, a paid theme. You can get to it, um, you can get to my mention of it through, you know, Pinterest.com forward slash Kathy Sipple Marketing Toolbox, and this is that ebook that I, I kind of wrote. And um, if you do end up wanting that, you can either, you know, use my link, which I would appreciate, if, especially if you want to become a developer, then you might want to purchase it. It is fairly affordable. I think it's $69 for about 80-something themes. Or I already have the developer license. So if you'd like to purchase just one theme, I, I gave you the option in the ebook to, um, you know, to contact me, and I'd be happy to, you know, not only give you the theme for $49, but I'll, you'll also get my my time to kind of help you get that theme installed. So I'll take you through, you know, that first step to get you over the hump, okay? So if that's something you're interested in, you can go to my um, my ebook. You can choose the click here if you want help, and that'll notify me that you're interested. Or you can, you know, obviously do it on your own. So we are out of time for today. We've packed a lot in for this week. I really want to thank you again for showing up and being a part of this ongoing learning experience. Uh, you're all very welcome. I will post this video as we have been to the YouTube channel, so hopefully everybody knows how to get there by now. You can find it from cothrive.org learning tab. All the archived uh, sessions that we've done are available there, so you can catch yourself up on any. And um, we'll be back. I think next week we're going to take a little different approach as discussed.